Good morning again. How are you, friends? Did anyone sleep last night? Are we out drinking beer and singing karaoke until 3 a.m.? <laughs> I'm going to keep this a pretty casual session. I've never presented this paper before, uh, and I like my presentations to be interactive anyway. So if you've got a question during the presentation and you throw your hand up and I see it, I'll do my best to answer your question. There are a fair few models out there. I've already added uh, a new model this morning. We're going to be talking about the data that is inside these models based on this particular paper. I'll have this showing again at the end, but that QR code will take you to a download of this paper. I think it's about 20 pages as a PDF. No one else has done this. Uh, there are people at Allen AI, the lab named after Paul Allen, that went and smashed through some common crawl data, and I've used them as a reference. There are people that have looked at the books inside these models, and there are people that have analysed the Reddit, the upvoted submissions in these models, but this particular way of articulating and putting it all together and showing the top 50 domains within models like GPT-3 uh, is unique. You may remember this from yesterday, and between the keynote and this morning, there's a new model on there. It's called Vima Visuo Motor Attention Model, released by NVIDIA and friends. It's down the bottom right there, the little yellow one. Very, very similar to DeepMind Gato, which was the crazy transformer-based model that can do text, images, it's learned Atari game button pushes, so it beats humans at a range of Atari games, and can also manipulate robotic arms. So NVIDIA and Tsinghua and a bunch of other labs got together and recreated the Gato model. It's a little bit smaller, it's 200 million parameters versus 1.2 billion parameters for Gato, but it's completely open source. So you can go and download Vimo right now play around with the weights, play around with the data, and hook it up to a robot if you want. It is the latest of the greatest. With all this attention on the models and the parameter counts and how many years it takes to train a model and how many GPUs we can push at a model, GPT-3, like I mentioned yesterday, had access to 10,000 GPUs and trained for the equivalent of 355 years I didn't see much in the way of analysing what they were actually training on. People were more obsessed with what they could get out of it, the hardware, the actual transformer architecture, but I was very, very interested in knowing what we can actually analyse from the data sets. Because these labs, to a certain extent, are very good at collaborating with each other, and they will talk to each other, and they will be open in their papers, but not to the level of detail that I wanted. Obviously, data sets have been increasing in size since the release of GPT-1. Today, we have the largest model, DeepMind Gopher and DeepMind Chinchilla, that use massive web and massive text with about 10 terabytes of data, currently the record holder, but people are trying to catch up. We mentioned yesterday that Probably the first major model, Google's BERT model, combined books and Wikipedia as their starter data set. And this has been a bit of a standard. Find some books, find some Wikipedia, and have a play with it. There will be some QR codes throughout this presentation that you can scan in and actually jump directly to the repositories to download that. This is a look at the book corpus data set. OpenAI actually referred to this as the Books Corpus data set. It's based on the Toronto Book Corpus data set and it's essentially a copy of Smashwords books. These are unpublished books, you may have some in there yourself, that are available in some cases for free, some cases for a dollar contribution. 
from authors around the world that have added their books into this repo. And OpenAI essentially went and dragged out a particular number of these. 4,000 paid and unpaid books here, 70,000 of them available for free. The repo that's been made available through Hugging Face, we mentioned this briefly yesterday, the Transformer uh, repository or, or central repo where you can go and play around with Transformers, also hosts data sets. And they've hosted a new version of Book Corpus that includes a little bit more history books. Here's a very brief overview of the genres inside the book corpus. I found this to be quite interesting. So we're training models on essentially unpublished works that might be amateur authors, and our number one data set there is romance. <laughs> We've got a bit more along the lines from fantasy, vampires, which they ended up consolidating, all the way through to history and themes for a total of about 11,000 books. Again, this was the data set used to train BERT, some of BERT, and it was the data set that was used to train all of GPT-1, this book corpus. Essentially a proof of concept in 2018. In 2019, GPT-2 took a different approach. The books was working. When we shove all this data into the model, it comes out and makes these amazing connections. We've got a hundred so a hundred or so million parameters, but GPT-2 wanted to be a little bit bigger and a little bit better. So they decided to use, by way of proxy, Reddit upvoted submissions as an indicator of popularity of a website. So rather than just going to grab a Google crawl, they went to Reddit for about 10 years worth of data and found the most upvoted submissions, those with three or more upvotes and found 45 million plus links that they went and crawled, extracted the text, removed the boilerplate, did a lot of filtering, and they brought that 18 terabytes of data all the way down to, let's take us back here, to 40 gig. Chopped it in half, essentially. Oh, sorry, a lot more than chopped it in half. <laughs> They really scrapped a lot of the, and there is a lot of uh, filtering that goes on. They really scrapped a lot of the crud that's in there, and you have to do a lot of cleanup in the filtering process to get data that you can then go and to tokenize. Let's have a look at this push shift directory. This started out as one guy who thought, let's go and crawl Reddit submissions starting quite a number of years ago, and let's store both the submissions, which might be submissions to uh, about the New York Times or about an article on Slashdot or about an article uh, that's popular on Medium. Let's store that, but let's also store the comments. Today we're only talking about, for training for GPT-2 and GPT-3 and other models, we're only talking about the actual submissions rather than the comments though some dialogue models do use the comments in there as well. So you can click on these and it will immediately start downloading. You've got both the submissions directory there, which is huge, as well as the comments directory there, both of them updated within the last week or so. So GPT-2 was very, very popular once it was trained on this 40 gig of very popular web data. It's still used today in unusual ways. There's an organization in Turkey that has applied GPT-2 to essentially fortune telling or astrology, daily astrology. The model will go and run itself across that particular star sign and spit out some feedback, spit out a response. You'll find GPT-2 being applied in some of the code generation models as well. GPT-2 is the basis of replica.ai, the most popular chatbot model at the moment, but far, far smaller than any of the other major chatbot models. 
So GPT-2 was 2020, uh, 2019. We moved to 2020, and GPT-3, the OpenAI guys, wanted to go a little bit louder. And they certainly did. They took the book corpus. They kept the Reddit submissions, although they bumped that up a little. And then we added Wikipedia for the first time. I used to work a lot with children and their families, and they would tell me that teachers told them that Wikipedia is not a reliable source. There has been some work on that in the last few years where I would consider Wikipedia to be a reliable source when we're checking citations. Meta AI recently released a transformer-based model that will go and help Wikipedia automatically check their citations. In this case, we're going to grab Wikipedia text, again, remove the boilerplate, but we've got a lot of information that comes out of that one. If you went to download just the current Wikipedia articles without comments, without history, without talk, it would still be about, or more than, 86 gig worth of data. That one looks a lot like this. This is without images, 19 gig compressed, 86 gig uncompressed. And you can obviously download all of this without much hassle. You can click that and throw that on an external hard drive. Once again, I was interested in what is inside Wikipedia. Someone has gone and analysed Wikipedia by articles and given a bit of a rundown on what that looks like. Biography as the number one source in that particular data set all the way through to science and math, which doesn't really get a very good showing, 3%, and education, less than 2%. As a resource, every major model now is using Wikipedia as almost the foundation of its data set, of its training data set. You can see that GPT-3 grabbing 11 gig worth of Wikipedia after filtering, even though, as we mentioned, it was a whole lot bigger than that. We're looking at more like 86 gig, filtering that out to about 11 gig. Some get a lot smaller than that because they filter it in different ways. And used for all the major models that are on that list there, so Megatron 11B, my favourite model, and I'm going to... Highly recommend that you play around with that one. It's very, very easy to play with. Microsoft and NVIDIA's model there, MTNLG, and all of the DeepMind models as well using Wikipedia. Here's the big guy. You'll probably need quite a large SSD to download this one, but it might be good in the events that the nuclear hellfire rains down upon us. They call this one Common crawl in general. Google have given it their own brand name and their own version of the common crawl that they call the C4. I've seen different ways of articulating this one. Colossal clean crawled corpus is the main reference here. But obviously you could find some Cs in common crawl as well. Over 320 terabytes. And this is a crawl, again, from probably the last 10 years or so of all the internet they could find. The cool thing about this one is that Alan AI had already gone and done some work on this one. They made this a searchable database. There's a, cat a catalog or an index of everything that was put inside C4. So this part interested me for sure. We can definitely go and search inside the books that we used to train. We can go and search inside of the popular internet, popular web via Reddit, via push shift. Now we can search on pretty much any keyword inside the Allen Institute for AI's version of the C4 index. Here's what that looks like. Now, this may not be exactly what OpenAI and Microsoft use for their version of the common crawl, but it's going to be very, very similar. This is Google's version. 
if I were to throw in a keyword here for something like DevOps, you'll see 1,700 results here. including a reference to the Wikipedia page. That one's not going to be too interesting to us because Wikipedia will be duplicated when we're training with this data set anyway. So we'll probably drop the common crawl and use the most recent version of Wikipedia. We could search for any domain here. We could search for something in tags as well. Let's grab James' name here, which is cool to have access to him in 2022. We get a few different versions of James here. Not all of them are Java James. But it gives an indication of what was used in those 355 years worth of GPU equivalent time while a model like GPT-3 is sitting there learning connections between these tokens, between these words. I'm betting that you'd like to see if your own name is in there in the common crawl, which may or may not suggest that it's inside GPT-3. You're welcome to uh, scan this and have a look for yourself. I have a <coughs> Go ahead for a question, please. Oh, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. This is a question about English versus multilingual data. The common crawl, there is a multilingual version of the common crawl, MC4, that contains, uh, well, 100, 200 languages. The model that you will have seen earlier or at the start of the conversation is basically covering a lot of different multilingual models. There's one there called... NLLB by Meta AI stands for No Language Left Behind. It contains 200 different languages. It was trained on 200 different languages. GPT-3 didn't, wasn't intentionally trained on non-English languages, but it's about 17% other languages. You'll certainly have Dutch in there. For this version of C4, I believe we'll be looking at English, but there are definitely options to download a multilingual version. Thank you for that question. All right, we've got some coverage on books, on popular web via Reddit, via push shift, via common crawl as web, and via Wikipedia. Before we throw all that into the black box and let it train for a couple of hundred years, we actually want to set some different weightings on this one. This is from the GPT-3 paper, and it's looking at the weightings for these different data sets. You'll see, if you just look at the column on the right, you'll see that we give a lot more weight to places like Wikipedia and to the Reddit popular web, which is labeled there as Web Text 2, and we get less weighting for books too. I believe that one is academic articles. Different models, different labs will use different weightings, allowing them to get different results, obviously. If we look at some of the huge models, MTNLG, Palm, they go a little bit crazy with how much data they throw at it. And there are alternative data sets that we'll have a quick look at now. So a couple of years ago, there was a grassroots band of developers that got together called Eleuther AI, E-L-E-U-T-H-E-R, comprised of data scientists and data engineers that wanted to replicate what was being done by the major billion dollar AI labs and corporations. So they collected these data sets and they trained their own models. But they collected these data sets themselves 
and made it available to the public. So all of this stuff is open source, rightly or wrongly. We're not getting into IP or copyright discussions today. They came up with an 825 gig data set that they called the pile. And the pile contains a whole bunch of disparate sources brought together and originally used by Luther AI to train models like GPT-J, GPT-NeoX-20B, but now is being used by the big labs as well. You'll see Microsoft use this and others. There are some things that will be seen and heard in this presentation that won't be seen or heard anywhere else. You'll notice the fourth row there of a collected data set. It's called Literotica. That was collected by Luther AI as one of the big data sets, probably a few gig worth, certainly a few million tokens. And like you have to do in this emerging field, they made a decision about the use of this particular data set. And the decision was to eliminate it, to censor it, not to include this particular data set because of the content. They also collected the entire US congressional minutes from the last 100 plus years. Everything that had been said on record in the US Congress, imagine how much data that is with your equivalent of handset reporters in those days, but also imagine what kind of content came out of those conversations. Even if you go back 60 or 70 years, Eleuther AI found that the references to slavery in there were also something that they did not want to have in the data sets that they used to train their models. So they eliminated the US congressional record as well. Some of the collected data sets here are really unusual. Hacker News, a complete data set of the conversations and the submissions that come through that particular community with that particular way of thinking and speaking. The high quality or otherwise conversations from Stack Exchange. A very, very specific IRC channel there, the Ubuntu IRC channel, with all of the logs <laughs> from a number of years used to train some of the largest models available today. They used a different look at the books corpora or books data set. They didn't use books corpus. They were not completely forthcoming with what they did use. Uh, Bibliotic is in there, of course, but you can go and grab the equivalent here using Project Gutenberg, which is an easy download. In multiple languages, 60 gig for the English version and a spliced down version of that one for a PG rating of that particular data set called SPGC. Again, easy download, open source, Project Gutenberg books are out of copyright books that are available and a really cool training data set. You'll see a lot more scientific sources in the pile. They went and grabbed a number of academic journal repositories. They grabbed the PubMed stuff, philosophy archives, the complete ec extracts from archive.org, ARXIV, which includes a lot of AI and ML papers. If we were to compare the two models, GPT-3 versus GPT-J and GPT-Neo, they might look a little bit like this. Of course, there's a lot of crossover between these, but just by way of example, you'll see that they're a lot more explicit on the right-hand side about what they collected, and they also went and collected it explicitly. It's almost like GPT-3 will have fell into some of these resources if it came to them via the common crawl or via the upvoted web the Reddit submissions. This is the unweighted view of these data sets pre-training. After we weight these, it will look a little bit different. But you'll notice the 
similarities there with Common Crawl, with the Reddit submissions, with Wikipedia, and then just how different the pile looks when they've got different allocations of books, of academic journals like PubMed, moving all the way up through to, they've gone and dug up the Enron emails, which is a publicly available resource up the top right there, to help with dialogue models and to help with conversation. NVIDIA and Microsoft thought, well, the pile looks pretty cool, so we'll use a particular percentage of the pile as well in that massive Megatron MTNLG model, 530 billion parameters. You'll notice they chose to exclude some things. They weren't comfortable using the Enron emails. I don't think they've got the YouTube subtitles in there. And there's a few others that they've replaced with their own more up-to-date versions of Common Crawl. But this is a view of what they chose to keep. So this fairly small group of open source developers, Alutha AI, ended up setting the tone for some of the major AI labs just through what they went and collected in their free time. This is quite a focus on the Western world and the labs that are mainly out of Silicon Valley in the US. But of course, Silicon Valley does not have a monopoly on artificial intelligence. What's happening over in China, throughout Europe to a certain extent, we've got Germany doing some good things. South Korea is pretty major, and they use the equivalent data sets of what we're looking at here. So China used their version of Wikipedia, their encyclopedias, their social media, they'll go and drag the conversations out of that and their version of Common Crawl as well. On the left, Pangu Alpha, which is a Chinese model. On the right, Udao 2.0, which made a lot of controversy when it came out because they had 10 trillion parameters of a uh, sparse model. Go ahead, please. That's an excellent question, thank you. The question was about ethics and also fake news. Google are on the way to hiring 200 ethicists internally whose full-time job is gonna be focusing on ethics of AI, including data set selection. Fake news is definitely a, a interesting conversation. If you think of pre and post-war steel, <laughs> pre-war, pre-nuclear fallout, steel was very, very pure. After the first bombs were dropped, we noticed uh, different chemical compounds showing up in our steel because of that radiation. I think the current internet is a lot like that. If you say the midpoint was GPT-2 release in 2019, everything after that point, uh, and it can't be labelled and can't be watermarked, could be generated by AI, in some cases is generated by AI. There are entire subreddits, entire podcasts that are generated by GPT-2 or GPT-3 or other models. So if we're talking about AI-generated content, that's definitely a concern, and I'm not sure how they're gonna address that. If we're talking about fake news, I definitely don't know how they're gonna address that, because that one is more of a human issue. Thank you for your question. So we feed something like GPT-3 with 750 gig of training data. Nearly a terabyte of training data. It crunches through that data for the equivalent of 300 plus years on several thousand GPUs. At the end of it, what are the top data sets. Well, we can't actually tell because it's a black box, but we can tell what were the top training domains, the top training domains in the different data sets. And I've done that. This is an appendix inside the paper that looks at what would have been the highest domains trained pre-weighting, because different models, different labs will use different weightings to get to our final model. You'll notice Wikipedia shows up at the top there. 
Google Patents, which I'm probably not surprised to see because it's so huge, shows up as number two. But interesting to see the other domains that show up after Wikipedia. And Wikipedia by category is interesting to me. But look at archive.org, Blogspot, which probably doesn't help us, GitHub at number 12, the New York Times there at number 14, WordPress not too helpful, Washington Post, Wikia, BBC, New York Times coming back. There's a little bit of duplication here. There are some sources there that have been going for 100 plus years and they've got a lot of data. They also generate a lot of data daily, so they're cool to keep as an updated data set as well. There may be some surprising data sets in there. Uh, I was looking at IPFS this morning, which is part of the common crawl may not be something that people automatically go to on a web search, but is part of these GPT-based models. Any questions so far? Yes, please. Great question. Bias based on what data you feed it. I wonder if we can get to GPT-4chan by Yannick Kilcher. Yannick grabbed the academic research from a paper called Raiders of the Lost Keck, which is, I think it was a look at the poll boards on 4chan. Here we go. 3.5 years of augmented 4chan posts from the politically incorrect board. These were real conversations. And Yannick went and trained an entire model based on GPTJ with this poll conversation. Hugging Face looked at it, and the CEO of Hugging Face said, we don't like this. He's on record in writing saying, we should remove this model, and they have removed that model. You can both train from scratch a model on biased data, and you can also fine tune a model far more easily on biased data. It's a much longer conversation than a 50 minute presentation, but what is biased data? I wrote perhaps a naive paper a little while ago that I called summum bonum. Let's see if we can find this one. And it argued essentially that if we went and found summum bonum sources, Latin for the ultimate good sources, and trained our model on it, then we'd have a really cool model. I've changed my views on that one, but it was essentially looking at non-controversial sources for training these models. I was saying, what if we went and trained a model with transcripts writing from the Dalai Lama, from... Uh, Emerson, for example, conversations with Werner Erhardt, what would that look like? Because at the moment, if we look at popular sources, how helpful is that going to be in a model? I've since changed my views because I think we do need to train it with absolutely everything. We're going to cover that in a moment and then give it a bit of steering. But that as in, is an entire field and conversation. That's not perhaps something just for computer scientists, and I don't know how we solve the question, but it's certainly something that is being looked at right now. So if you go into some of these big labs right now, OpenAI, Anthropic AI, Google AI, Meta AI, they have ethicists there, philosophers there, uh, linguists there that are helping with the selection and then the tuning of this data. How do we go on answering that bias question? I know, absolutely. I would have liked a better answer than we don't like this, let's delete it, which was done in the case of the GPT-4chan model, uh, and that was Hugging Face's response. I'm seeing a little bit of that. This field is extraordinary in that there's so much sharing and collaboration between labs, but they're also spending a bit more time than I would on making sure that they're hamstringing these models. If you look at DeepMind's Sparrow, a recent release 
based on Chinchilla, the largest model in the world, they gave it 23 rules to follow. No bias, no stereotypes, no microaggressions. Uh, they wouldn't let it say that, uh, well, an example of that one was they gave it a sentence of, man is to doctor as woman is to blank. And they essentially crafted it in such a way that it would only give the response of doctor. OpenAI may be doing the same thing with some of their responses, especially for Dolly 2, which was only allowing outputs that were perceived in the current zeitgeist to be unbiased. Thank you. Could you not really use AI to determine the credibility of sources and then feed that into the model? Absolutely. Could we use AI to determine credibility of sources and then feed that to the model? That's certainly a point of research. Meta AI are doing some amazing work there, and I think that's where we're going to get to, because as we're moving through terabytes and terabytes of data, trillions and trillions of words or tokens, we're getting stuff that even the smartest human cannot get through, cannot go and process. Here's what's coming next. Here's what I see as coming next to bookend that question. To get to the scale of data sets that we're going to need for the next few models, we can keep using human data. There is enough data there to train a model that may be 200 billion parameters, maybe more. We're going to need to use pretty much every book published, and we'll show one more alternative for that in a moment. But Gartner reckons we're going to be using more and more Synthetic data, data that's actually been produced by the models. At the moment, you can ask GPT-3 or other models to produce testing data, generate testing data for us, generate conversations for us, generate characters, and of course, it can generate entire prompt and responses to essentially test itself. But we're also going down this path of having it generate synthetic data like the post-war steel that is from this super intelligence. A really gray area and a really interesting area. I've not gone too far into it. This is the next piece. Consider that today, there are 800 million videos on YouTube. The average length of each of those videos is about 12 minutes. The average human speaks at 150 words per minute. If we take those 1,700 words, multiply that by 800 million videos, we may get 1.4 trillion words of text data. We've not drilled into tokens yet, but essentially tokens allow us to use more words more efficiently. Let's have a very quick look at tokens just for a moment. So rather than store all the million plus words that we've got in the English language, when they've got their data sets, they do have to break it into tokens. And tokens look a lot like this. Here we go. Catalyst breaks up into the word catalyst. If I say my cat is catatonic, it breaks up into those tokens. The words cat and the start of catatonic, even though they're colored differently, are actually the same tokens there. Thirty-seven ninety-seven. When we apply that to the current models, we say that a word is 0 0.75 tokens. So if we generate our 0 1.4 trillion words of text data on YouTube today, we might get something more like 2 trillion tokens which is what we're probably aiming for for the next big models. But YouTube is constantly refreshed. They talk about having 3.7 million new videos uploaded every day. I think DevOx has helped with that in the last 24 hours. About 6.5 billion new words a day, and if we tokenize that, 
We're looking at 8.6 billion words per day. GPT-3 was trained on 300 billion tokens. It probably should have been trained on 3 trillion tokens because they were not compute optimal in the way that they did things. And DeepMind Chinchilla essentially retaught how we should be doing that with the Chinchilla scaling. But if we're aiming for 3 trillion tokens and we can use the words that are being spoken and have been spoken on YouTube, that might be a cool way to do things. So very, very recently, within the last couple of weeks, OpenAI came up with a transformer-based model called Whisper. And this thing is ridiculous. How many people have used Otter AI or something similar where you can speak and it will transcribe your audio file for you? We've come a long way since Dragon Naturally Speaking. This is able to do different languages. It's able to do punctuation, and it's able to do really thick and strange accents. It's built into the playground, so you can use this right now for free. But if I start talking at this, this is a look at OpenAI Whisper. If I start talking at this, it will be very, very accurate with its trans transcription of what I'm saying, including the punctuation there. If I put on a pretty nasty Australian Steve Irwin accent and say, crikey, it'll even be pretty good with that. You can go and use this for free right now. It's the microphone up the top here, and that particular button allows us to click it, and anything we say there will be transcribed in real time, and you can actually put this straight into your prompt. You'll notice that it also includes punctuation, it includes very thick accents. There are examples of it translating from a very, very thick Scottish accent. I believe if I give it, and my Chinese is not perfect, but I believe if I ask it, it will even convert that into English for us. Or in this case, it will convert it to not quite very good pinyin. Imagine running this across the 800 million YouTube video baseline that's now probably towards 1 billion YouTube videos. And this, I believe, is what OpenAI's Whisper is setting out to do. Setting out to be available to build these massive, massive data sets. If they're aiming for 2 trillion tokens and they only got to 300 billion in that first data set, they've got a long way to go recommend that you play around with this particular text-to-speech based on the transform model. It's a lot of fun. Fantastic. Here's the download link for the paper again. I'm very much open to any questions. Yes, go ahead, please. That's a really good question. Can we feed it with video data to give it context? Because we lose things in body language, in tone, uh, even in the actual image. What I've been talking about today is just the large language models, but we can certainly see this showing up in other models. For example, in DeepMind Flamingo, which I believe I cover in... Oh, let's see if this can find it for us. Some of these models go and find examples of images and are then able to translate that in a really, really unusual way. This is my mid-year report. This is the sky is bigger, my mid-year report. Here is my photo. This photo was fed to Flamingo, which is a multimodal model, which means it looks at images as well. The model was then asked questions and it output these statements. This is a picture of Barack Obama. He's a former president of the United States. There are at least five people in the picture. There are at least two mirrors in the picture. Obama's foot is positioned on the right side of the scale. Flamingo is the, one of the largest multimodal models in the world. What it is capable of is out of control. It is, again, jarring and confronting in what it can do. At the moment, for large language models, I believe we're still just looking at feeding it text for playing around with what's happening in the videos that may be possible. There are some vision transformers like Clip, 
like Flamingo that can go and look at the videos and also feed that back into the model as well. So it'll be really exciting to see if that happens for GPT-4. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, for sure. Can AI create a joke, a funny joke, a new joke? Happens all the time. The funny part is kind of arguable. <laughs> we have had Lita uh, create some cool jokes for us. There's an episode of Lita, must be around episode 40, where I had her in the room speaking with three triplets. Those triplets were about nine years old. And uh, they asked her what was the earliest playground. And Lita said the earliest playground was a bunch of sticks. And the triplet said, well, that doesn't sound very fun. What did they do? And Lita said, they just sit there and stare at it. That's their playground. Let's ask Lita with this prompt here via GPT-3 to tell us a joke. Come on. <laughs> this is why we don't do live coding, or why I don't do li live coding. A, wa a horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, why the long face? It's funny because it doesn't make any sense. Get it. Thank you, Lita. She has, or it has come up with new words before. So GPT-3 via this Lita prompt has come up with the term bush joy to describe the feeling that you get when you're walking through the Australian bush. Here, the start of her joke is, what do you call a bear with no ear? <laughs> <laughs> B. I don't know if that's a new joke. I'm sure that might be in the data set somewhere. Yes, it's absolutely capable of telling new jokes and writing stories, writing poems, uh, writing story books like you saw yesterday, writing limericks. We had a fairly offensive li limerick that's in one of the early episodes of Lita. Um, it's the, the capabilities of these models is unprecedented and extraordinary. Yes, please. A new genre? Yeah. Can it create a new genre of music? From what I've seen, it would be capable of that. It's able to create its own words, its own language. Some of the music that it has created is extraordinary. There is a model called OpenAI Jukebox that I recommend you also go and have a play with that creates music from scratch. This was post-Transformer, but it really saw no good publicity Someone fed it with some Jeff Buckley Grace songs, and it came out with these rewrites of Jeff Buckley Grace, including singing new lyrics. I'm not plugged into audio here, but you can definitely find that online. It's, it's extraordinary. Any other questions for this morning before we wrap up? Yes, please. What's the last bit? Uh, is there some kind of definition of done? Of done. <laughs> I love those questions. Um, can you give me the first one again, please? Uh, about redundancy, and redundancy and data. So there is always going to be crossover in data. When I showed that slide of you know two trillion tokens, if we went and listened and transcribed YouTube, when you clean that up, that may be less than half a trillion tokens, 500 billion tokens, maybe less. I mean, you've got to chop out every time someone says, hey, YouTube, click the subscribe button. All of that kind of boilerplate needs to be removed. And to a certain extent, they play around with removing duplication and redundancies as well. At the moment, the scaling laws are still applying. So the bigger the model, the more it can do and the more outrageous things it can do like looking at a photo and seeing that the guy had his foot on the scale. <laughs> there is no limit at the moment 
to the possibilities here, and I think even though we're in the middle of it, we're kind of still just touching on that. To have a robot be able to interact with the world just from a transformer language model and binding different vision models on top of it, they're finding that it's still coming out with new capabilities. The larger they make this, the more data they feed this. One more question and we'll go. How about copyrights? Copyright, excellent. I just did a presentation to a bunch of lawyers at Bond University and they were very, very concerned with copyright. I lent one of them my phone and said, generate whatever image you like. She generated this beautiful image and said she's going to use it in her slide deck. And then uh, she asked, who owns this? And I said, well, this particular one is Stable Diffusion. And they've said that legally anyone who generates an image using their own prompt owns it. And the professor said, but I did it on your phone. I said, well, you'll have to pay me royalties. <laughs> <laughs> IP is a big and hairy issue. It's outside of my remit. There's a lot of controversy here. The EU are messing around with regulations and playing around with their own AI acts. Uh, certainly it's something that at the moment has not been rigorously applied by any of the labs because once the data sets are fed to that black box and trained for a couple of hundred years, the result should not contain the original data, should only contain the parameters that were found during training, the connections between tokens. So if you go and feed it Wikipedia and then you try and query out an original Wikipedia article, to a certain extent that's not really possible. It's not that it's gone and memorized that, it's gone and memorized what should come after that particular token and then provided that as an output. A whole lot of experts need to be involved in the training and the messing around of these datas, data sets and models. It's not just computer scientists anymore, but you're certainly on the bleeding edge of what's happening. And I appreciate you guys being open today and thank you so much again for your attention. Thank you. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. Love artificial intelligence? Excited by the explosive progress of integrated AI? I am. Join my private mailing list, The Memo. Did you get that memo? Yeah, I got the memo. Get priority access to my articles, videos, and behind the scenes tips as soon as they're released with a monthly or annual subscription. Yeah. Didn't you get that memo? Life Architect dot AI slash memo. I have the memo.